Chapter 26 of The War of Antichrist with the Church and Christian Civilization. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Fred Abood. The War of Antichrist with the Church and Christian Civilization by Monsignor George F. Dillon. Chapter 26 Catholic Total Abstinence Society No society can be conceived better adapted to keep working men from those bad associations which we have been considering, or more calculated to bring every blessing to individuals and, above all, to homes. The public house, the drinking saloon, the music hall, the obscure Sheban, wherever, in one word, drink is sold, is the antechamber of the secret society for men, and ruin both of men and women. On this point, permit me to be plain with you, my Catholic fellow countrymen, as I may call you, for I find that the majority, indeed the mass of the Catholic congregations in Edinburgh, as well as in Glasgow, in Manchester, in Leeds, in Birmingham, and in all the large towns of England and Scotland are men and women mainly, if not entirely, of Irish birth or Irish blood, the children of Irish parents. It is, the world knows, from you that the faith has come to Great Britain by the providence of God in this 19th century. In the Highlands, I am told, there are some 12,000 genuine Scotch Catholics. In the lowlands, it is doubtful whether so many genuine Scotch Catholics can be found. But the number of Catholics in Scotland is a quarter of a million. And the excess comes from the Irish, whose migration has made the church. I believe the proportion in England, notwithstanding the conversion of so many by reason and grace, and the holding out of several old families, is still greater in favor of the Irish element. From the converts and the good old Catholic families come many blessed with vocations for the priesthood, who devote their lives with great zeal to the service of the race which forms the majority, the Mass of the Church. Now I praise that Mass, to which I myself belong, when it deserves to be praised, but you will allow me the liberty of a friend to blame a portion of it when it deserves blame. God, who knows all hearts, knows that I desire to do the blaming as a friend. I praise you for what I see you do. The churches, the cathedrals, magnificent in many cases as both are, the schools, the houses of teaching orders, are mainly the work of your hands. The priesthood that has been brought to minister everywhere and the active orders of men and women who teach are kept in the very largest measure by you. Notwithstanding all your burdens, your poverty, and your local wants, great everywhere, you give with a willingness unequaled by any other race to every good work. Of you, at home and abroad, generous, faithful people, it may be said that you realize to the very letter the truth that it is better to give than to receive. And what a blessing do you not in return receive in this land when you remain faithful to the teachings of that religion for which God has enabled you to do so much. There is not a city I have visited that I do not find some amongst you, who came to this country as poor as the rest, already risen to affluence and ease, sometimes to public and honorable position amongst their fellow citizens, differing from them more widely in religion than in race. There is no place where I have not been consoled with the signs of substantial prosperity amongst you. Pleasant it is for me, when visiting the many educational establishments now, thank God, 
so plentifully diffused over the face of the country, to find your sons in the colleges, your daughters in the convents, and to know that not a few of them dedicate themselves to the highest service of God. These prove the happy, holy homes which bless them with true parental love and care, and cast round their childhood the influences of religion. I have at this moment before my mind's eye the death of an Irish mother who passed to eternity since I commenced my present journey, consoled by having her deathbed surrounded by children, every one of whom were holy, and several of whom had the happiness of being either religious or priests. This valiant Catholic mother came to one of the great cities of England, the wife of an Irish working man. She had her reward surely in this life, as well as in the next. In your own midst, there are instances of the honest prosperity which blesses the sober, well-conducted, though poor man, who comes to this country to make an honest livelihood. If he be but faithful to his religion, his life is always happy, his end is always holy, his children rise up and call him blessed. He is a blessing to the church and to this country. I could easily prolong this picture, but I must speak plainly upon another. I have seen even in this city hundreds of little children, as I passed yesterday, Sunday, through your streets. Many of them were Catholics, certainly. Poor children, they saluted me reverently. They were, I found, sent, for the law happily forces that, to the Catholic school. That was the reason why the light of faith was in their little eyes, which brightened at the sight of a priest. But alas, the sign of hunger was upon the cheeks, and upon the almost naked limbs of many of them, without shoes, without stockings, and in rags. I have seen children, too, many of whom I know to be Catholic and Irish, selling newspapers in the streets on weekdays, and preparing boys and girls for careers I shudder to contemplate after a very few years. On yesterday, I had evidence of the cause of their sad state. I saw men and women, the fathers and mothers of these children, crowding round public houses, openly intoxicated, and in consequent wretchedness upon the streets. I know, of course, that a large proportion of these were not Irish, but I know also, from inquiries I made, that a large proportion was. These were the degraded, abominable parents who reduced their own little ones to the sad condition in which the whole world could see them. I do not suppose that in a respectable gathering like this such drunkards are found. But I allude to the matter in the hope that my words and opinions may, through you who are here, come to them, that they may know that while I praise my beloved fellow country people for what they have done so nobly and so well for the works of religion, I have no words strong enough to reprobate the conduct of those who give themselves to drink in this country at all. I say at all, for to commence with, where, I ask, is the working man to be found, or the working man's wife, who, having undertaken the care and responsibility of the present and the future of the numerous family it is generally their lot to have, can afford to spend earnings which belong to their children on the pernicious and expensive luxury of drink. A working man needs every fraction he can earn by his labor for the education and maintenance of his children. For the rainy day, for the season of sickness, for an honest independence in his old age. He cannot be honest to his children or to himself. He cannot advance religion, education, or the cause of God if he drinks. When a working man loses his employment, when he sickens, when he gets into trouble, we invariably 
find drink at the bottom of it. There is nothing that one can praise in the man who practices this vice. He is mean, and he is cruelly dishonest always. He drinks the shoes off his children's feet, the clothes off their backs, the bit from out their mouths, the bed from under them, the home from over them, and sends them upon society, boys degraded and girls so lost that I cannot contemplate the picture. It is therefore that good pastors like Cardinal Manning, who, because of his numerous Irish flock, regards himself in London as an Irish bishop, have undertaken a life-and-death crusade against this devil that preys upon the vitals of their most choice and devoted people. It is therefore that Cardinal McCabe and others have made so many personal efforts to uproot this vice. My own archbishop for many years, while bishop of Ossory in Ireland, practiced total abstinence in order to give his people an example. He is determined to make the same sacrifice in the new and vastly more extended field of labor which the Vicar of Christ has committed to his care in the Antipodes. I have great faith in such acts of self-denial coming from such quarters. When those of the flock who need restraint see the pastors placed over them by God make such sacrifices for their salvation, there cannot, it seems to me, be much doubt about the issue. What they can do, what such men as the late Mr. A. M. Sullivan and others have done, without any constraining necessity, others, who owe such restraint to themselves and their families, can do. For the mere temporal well-being of every working man and every working man's family, I would be glad to see every such man a total abstainer. But when I consider the evils to which the eternal salvation of the Irish working man, in these countries especially, is exposed by the habit of drinking, I can find no words strong enough to express my anxiety to see him give up intoxicating drinks absolutely and forever. The sacrifice is small, the gain enormous. God grant that all whom my words may reach, all Irish Catholics, may think with me on this point. Should that be so, the consequences would be indeed consoling. The Church of God might well rejoice. The days of secret societies would for the Irish end forever, and for a certainty they would carry out to its fullness the glorious destiny given them of planting the faith all the world over and resisting to the bitter end the wiles, the deceits, and finally the last and most terrible onset of the Antichrist against God, his church, and Christian civilization throughout the world. End of chapter 26 End of The War of Antichrist with the Church and Christian Civilization by Monsignor George F. Dillon